Father, in the name of Jesus, we also, from the day we first heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for one another and make special requests, asking that all of us may be filled with the full, deep, and cleared knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom in comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, in understanding and discernment of spiritual things. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that all of us would walk and live and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing and desiring to please Him in all things. That means we walk by faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God. We're going to bear fruit in every good work, and we're steadily going to grow and increase and in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper, clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition. We pray that all of us would be invigorated and strengthened with your power according to the might of your glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience with perseverance, forbearance, and joy. And just like Ted said, we're giving thanks to the Father you have qualified us through the blood of Jesus and through the confession of our faith and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints of God's holy people in the light. And so we declare this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, so, and so the way that we're going to, 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 to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and bear fruit in every good work, it's found in Romans 12. Uh, all of us are familiar with the way this starts out. Uh, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg you in view of all the mercies of God. So if there's a therefore, you don't start a sentence like that. There has to be a reason there's there. So I'm going to drop back four verses, Romans uh, 11, 33. Oh, the depth of riches about the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unfathomable, how inscrutable How unsearchable are his judgments and his decisions. How untraceable, mysterious, and undiscovered are his ways, his methods, and his paths. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has understood his thoughts? Who has ever been God's counselor? Who has first given God anything that he might be paid back or that he could claim a recompense? So God doesn't owe us nothing. We don't deserve anything. Because verse 36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things originate with him. All things come from him. All things live through him, and all things center in and consummate and end in him. To him be the glory forever and ever. And because we know that all things start in God and work through him and in him for his glory, now we can understand, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your, of your body, present all of your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, which means we walk away from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the deceitfulness of riches, We're not fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but we're transformed by the the entire renewal of our mind with its new ideals and its new attitudes so that we can prove for ourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in the sight for you. You can do the acceptable and the good will of God and you're still doing things that are related to to Christianity and his kingdom, but it may not be God's perfect plan. An example, when I was at the Baptist College 100 years ago in uh, 1974, uh, it was was big for people who were in music that uh, they got a bus, they traveled on the road with their kids, they went to different churches, and, and so somebody who might be called to support a specific pastor and stay there in that church and set the atmosphere for the word to go forth and to be received. Somebody might talk to them and convince them to get on the road and and have all the struggles of trying to homeschool their kids and go to a different place and where do you get gas and where do you get something to eat. And And it could be God's acceptable will for them to still be doing Christian work. 
but his perfect will might be for them to stay planted and rooted, supporting the specific pastor. So, so we have to get in God's presence to find out what his perfect will for us is, and it can modify over time. Uh, verse 3, for by grace... God's unmerited favor given unto me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate or think of himself more highly than he ought to think, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith apportioned uh, by God to him. God has given everybody a measure of faith, and, and uh, it's just like going to the gym. You have all the equipment available, you have to exercise that faith for it to grow. Uh, maybe you start off believing something small, and then over time as you get confidence in God's word and his promises and his anointing, then the, the, the faith can grow, just like our physical mu uh, muscles. For just as in one body we all have many parts and organs and members, and all of these parts do not have the same function or use, so we, numerous as we are, we are one body in Christ the Messiah, and individually we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on one another. So the, so the ear has a different function than the foot. They're part of the same body, but they've got to work together. The ear has to listen for the traffic and send a signal to the body so that the foot doesn't step out in the traffic so that the whole body gets hurt. And, and, and uh, many times because the ear and the foot are different, and because the way the body's built, they don't have fellowship with one another. Uh, you, you can't, at least I can't, I can't put my, my foot up next to my ear. But they're both important, and, and uh, what's important for us is Satan is under our feet, under the whole body. So even if I'm a baby toenail, or I'm a callus on the bottom of the foot, Satan is still under my feet by the power of the Word of God. So, so uh, Paul is talking now about seven gifts uh, that all of us have primarily one or two of these gifts. Uh, uh, this is different than the spiritual gifts, uh, which are listed in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, the power gifts, the wisdom gifts, the speaking gifts. Uh, here's the seven gifts uh, that differ according to the grace that's given unto us. Uh, he whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. Second one is practical service, let each give himself to serving. He who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts, who encourages in his exhortation, he who contributes, let him do it simply and liberally. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and secretness of mind, he who does acts of mercy, with genuine tillfulness and joyful eagerness. I heard a teaching from uh, Pastor Steve Himmel that made this uh, all fall into place. Uh, it's how you respond consistently to a situation lets you know which of the, of the seven gifts is your primary. For example, if I had that, uh, that glass close to the edge of the table and I, and I got up, and I was clumsy, and I knocked the water down on the floor, then how you respond to me knocking it down on the floor is going to tell you what your primary gift is. If you say, for example, the gift of prophecy, thus says the Lord, if you don't put the glass in the middle of the table, you're going to knock it over three or four times before you finally get your act together. The, the, the practical service is, oh, let me get a towel. I'll clean it up for you. Uh, for the one who teaches, now if you, if you have the glass and you only fill it half full and you put it in the center and move it out of the way, then you teach the person how not to do that. Uh, the exhorter, the encourager, oh, oh, all of us have knocked over water. Don't worry about it. And it's, and it's how you respond. He who gives, uh, I can see that that, uh, that cup has a small stem. So I'm going, to, I'm going to get you a big cup with a wide base that you cannot knock over unless you, unless you hit it with your hand or, or acts of mercy uh, where, where you sympathize with the person, uh, you don't criticize them. And so, and so each one of us has one of these seven gifts as a primary, 
and we can step into the other gifts as we need them. Prophecy, my normal gift is teaching, but I prophesy for this group, for this church, that what we're doing this first week of the year, that God is going to bless and multiply the efforts and touch people's hearts, and people are going to be strengthened and encouraged to follow the Master, bearing fruit in every good work, and we're going to give thanks to the Father, and we're going to increase in our wisdom and our strength by the power of the Word of God. Amen. So here are, here are the 13 verses in Romans 12 that give us the practical insight of, of how we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, how we please Him, how we bear fruit in every good work, how we increase in knowledge, how we give thanks to the Father. And since there's basically 13 different categories, uh, like anything else, you start small, you start with two or three that you pick out that means something to you, and then, and then work on that. And then as you, as you get your confidence and mature in those, add another one or two, maybe uh, in the middle of July or, or for next year. Here's the 13 things of how the practical instruction for 2019. Verse 9, let your love be sincere, a real thing. Uh, one of the things uh, in ministering in the jail, uh, the teaching has to be real, it has to be simple, and it has to be practical. And, and uh, people can see if, if you're a fake, if you're pretending to be something, so, so let your love be sincere out of your heart. And you do that by hating what is evil. You loathe all ungodliness and turn in horror from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's where you go. It's what you do. You hold on to what's good, which is God's kingdom, his purposes, his plans, his people. Uh, verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family. And uh, even though we're a family, sometimes there can be tensions and misunderstandings. But we give precedence. We show honor to one another. And, and especially honor to our, our parents. In the, in the Ten Commandments, that's the only commandment that has a promise. If you honor your father and mother, you'll live long in the land, regardless of their personality regardless of what they do or say, you still honor them as being your parents. Uh, verse 11, you never lag in zeal and earnest endeavor. You be aglow, you burn with the Spirit, serving the Lord. John the Baptist said, Jesus is coming, the Lamb. I'm not worthy to untie his shoelace. And I baptize you with water for repentance of sin but it is Jesus who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's still his role today. He still does that. Uh, to be burning with the Spirit, to, to be excited about his kingdom, his purposes, and serve the Lord. Uh, verse 12, you rejoice and exult in hope. Uh, Romans also says that God's hope does not disappoint because the love of God is poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. So we rejoice and exult in hope when we're steadfast and we're patient in suffering and tribulation uh, and be constant in prayer. Uh, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, I believe. Uh, 1 Peter 5, after you've suffered for a while, God himself will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So he knows what we're going through. And, and all of us are similar. All of us have good days. All of us has days that we struggle. But after we stay steadfast, after we stay patient, not just, not just an angel, not just a pastor, not just a, a Christian friend, but God himself will strengthen, perfect, confirm, and establish you. And that means you're going to make it through. Uh, another one, verse 13, contribute to the needs of God's people sharing in the necessities of the saints. Uh, 1 John says uh, that if you, have, uh, if you have the world's goods and you don't help your brother who's in need, how can the love of God abide in you? If you see your fellow believers struggling 
with food or clothes or, or sickness and you don't do something to help them out. Uh, pursue the practice of hospitality. The idea there, uh, sometimes we entertain angels without knowing it uh, who are sent on assignment for us, the, the, the children of God. Uh, verse 14, here's one that's going to be on the top of everyone's list. Bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you, even if they're in your own family. Bless and do not curse. So maybe we'll leave that one for next year, and we'll work on some of the easier ones. Uh, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice to share others' joy. Uh, the, the, the woman who had 10 coins, they were all valuable. She lost one. She got her broom. She lit a lamp. She swept the floor carefully. And when she found the lost coin, she called her girlfriends together and said, hey, I had a valuable coin that was lost. Even though I have nine others, I found the coin. And all of them rejoiced with her. Weep with those who weep and share others' grief. Uh, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Do not be snobbish. Do not be high-minded or exclusive, but readily adjust yourself to people and things and give yourselves to humble tasks. It's uh, kind of hard to be proud and haughty when you get a, a toilet brush and go in and clean the bathroom and have to scrub that, but, but we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing that in due season he will exalt us. He will exalt us. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceit. Uh, it was pride is the reason that, uh, that Lucifer fell from the exalted position as the choir leader in heaven. Uh, five times in Isaiah, he says, uh, I will be like the most high. I will exalt myself. I will sit on the throne. And uh, God booted him out like lightning and a third of the angels with him. Uh, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. Uh, sometimes things happen that are hurtful, uh, and, and I've had times I've approached people and said, uh, I had hard feelings against you, uh, please forgive me. It doesn't matter whether they accept it or not. My part is to let it go, to let it drop and not bring it up again. And uh, that's what Jesus did on the cross. If he can forgive the people who are ripping up his back like shredded wheat and ripping out his beard and uh, taunting him, uh, then, then we must also. Uh, verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Is it possible for us to live at peace? We make a firm quality decision not to be caught up in the drama, not to be, if, uh, if somebody's trying to stir up an argument, talk to the hand, walk away, maintain your peace, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, let your forbearing spirit be known to all men because the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer, by supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. What's the benefit? What do you get? The peace of God that passes all understanding will mount guard over your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So in the natural, as a, as a military officer who did, uh, uh, was in charge of the honor guard for two years on the state of Alabama, I presented the uh, American flag to the surviving family members of military members that were deceased. I know that in Washington, D.C., 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, there's a military person on guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Rain, snow, sleet, hail, it doesn't matter. Uh, ten years ago, when a hurricane came through Washington, D.C., they expected winds of over 120 miles an hour. And for the first time in their history, the honor guard was given a command that they could stand down and not be in the hurricane force winds. 
and they said it is our duty, it is our honor to walk this, the, to walk this uh, area, and we will not stand down. We're going to be out in the middle of the hurricane, and if we can do that in the natural, then the Holy Spirit can mount guard over my heart and mind in Christ Jesus 24 hours a day. And, and for me to make a firm quality decision, I'm going to live in peace. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And uh, the Father's long-suffering, not wanting any to perish, but all to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And, and we don't think God's system of justice is quick enough. We want to knock them off the porch and tell everybody that they slipped. But he was patient with us when we were a knucklehead, when we, when we raised our fist against him and said, no, I won't. And uh, I walked away from the faith for 18 years as a licensed minister, and the mercy of God brought me back after 18 years used the death of a six-year-old girl I didn't know with leukemia to bring me back to the faith. Compassion for somebody I didn't know, just read an article on paper and couldn't get her picture out of my mind. And the father said, I love you, you're my son. I miss you, I want you back. Well, that's a good deal. That's, that's a better deal than I've had. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head when he realizes how rough and how mean they've been and, and you're showing them kindness and love. Kindness is still a fruit of the Spirit which bears a harvest. Last one uh, of the 13 practical instructions how we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome master evil with good. Uh, here's, a, here's a quick example of this. Uh, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel. I think, I think it was uh, against the princess, uh, the, 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 the false god Diana, and it affected the businessmen. The tradesmen were saying, hey, if, if he keeps preaching, we're going to lose all of our business. We're not going to be able to support our families going on vacation. So they stirred up the town against them. Uh, so, the, so the prison warden beat the snot out of them and, and, and put them in the innermost prison reserved for the worst uh, uh, offenders. So it's open sewage. It's cold. Uh, their, their backs are, are bruised and bleeding. And, and, they're, and they're sitting on rocks. They're leaning against rocks. They can't lay down. They can't get comfortable. And so about midnight, they start singing, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And all of the prisoners were listening to them. So it wasn't just for Paul and Silas. It was for all of the prisoners. They knew that the warden beat the snot out of them. They knew that they were bruised and, and sore and they couldn't go to sleep. And then suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all of the chains fell off of all of the prisoners, even the scoundrels, even the murderers, even the thieves, even the pedophiles. And all of the doors opened, not only to their cell, but down the hallway to the front door. They had a clear path to get out of the door and uh, from the people I've talked to in St. Charles, they would immediately vacate the spot. The, the prison warden would have to take the penalty for everybody's sentence. So, so this one has two years, that one has three, that one has ten. He has to do a 15-year sentence to take on everybody's uh, penalty that, that, has, uh, uh, that escaped. So he draws his sword. He's going to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide. And, and it has a very distinctive sound, the metal coming out of the sheath, the same way today if somebody uh, uh, cocked a 12-gauge shotgun, everybody know what that sounds like. You hear a slide and gauge on a pistol, and you know you better stand very, very still, or, or this is going to be 
your opportunity to meet Jesus today. So Paul and Silas, even though the warden was the one who beat the snout out of them, they showed mercy to them. And Paul cries out with a loud voice, do yourself no harm for we're all here. And calling for the lights, the, the prison warden came in and saw that all the prisoners were there. And he got down on his knees before Paul and said, what do I need to do to be saved? And if Paul would have done like most of us, he hurt me. Take him out, God. Knock his teeth out, like it says in the Psalms. If he hadn't stepped up, the prison warden uh, would have taken his life, and that night uh, his wife would have been a widow and his kids would have been orphans. And so... He, the prison warden gets saved, and so he brings Paul and Silas to his house. So, so if they were singing about midnight, and then there was an earthquake, and then the jailer comes in, and he takes them to his house, what do you think they would do to the prison warden today if he took prisoners out and took them to his house and said, uh, hey, hey, baby, uh, I know it's one in the morning, and, and I've talked about all of these rough people that I have to, to watch every day and how I hate my job. Uh, but I brought a couple of them in. And, and so, baby, would you get up and would you cook some eggs and biscuits and, and put a little bacon in there or some orange juice and, and feed them breakfast? And while you're doing that, I'm going to get some water and soap and wash their wounds. Well, how'd they get them? Well, uh, I beat the snot out of them uh, because I was given orders. And so, and so while his wife is cooking breakfast... He's washing their wounds and putting salve on the wounds that he inflicted. Is that grace? Is that mercy? And then, and then his whole family goes out to a river in the middle of the night. Now it's, what, 2 in the morning, 2.30? And his entire family gets baptized after accepting Jesus as Savior. When they heard about the grace, Paul and Silas said, don't kill yourself because we're all here. All of the prisoners had the opportunity to leave but none of them did. All of the prisoners heard them singing the praise to God and it affected all of them and they stayed in place. And so the jailer, knowing that he's going to have to face the civil authorities the next day, he does the most important thing. He gets saved. Him and his family are saved. Let the chips fall. Do what you're going to do. I'm going to follow Jesus. And... and uh, we don't know what happened to him, but I can tell you when, uh, when uh, I want to say Herod put the 16 guards around, around Peter when he was in prison and, and uh, he had already beheaded James, saw that it pleased the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and so he's going he's gonna to behead Peter too and uh, had, had 16 guards around him, uh, one on each side, one outside the, his door down the hallway. And the, and the angel came in and had to slap Peter on the side and wake him up uh, uh, to get dressed. Now, if you knew that you were going to be beheaded in the morning, what do you think your chances of sleeping would be? Peter's sound asleep. You know, you know why? He had a prophetic word from Jesus that had not been fulfilled. In John 21, after, after Jesus uh, appears to the disciples in uh, John 20, he breathes on them. They receive the Holy Spirit, except for Thomas. The next morning, John 21, they go fishing. They don't catch anything all night. Uh, and then Jesus says, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Like, that's going to make a difference. But they follow the instruction and get a, get a boat-sinking, net-breaking load of fish you know how many there are? John, John 21? 153 large fish. What does that mean? That means instead of going out fishing uh, six nights a week, you only have to go out three nights a week for about three months because you can take those large fish to the, to the market and you can sell them and you have an economic surplus. And so you can go to your kid's soccer game and you can go to the family reunion down in the Sea of Galilee and, and you don't have to work as hard. And uh, so, so they're following Jesus. And, 
And, and Jesus says to Peter, when you're an old man, people are going to carry you bound up by the hand and, and, and take you to places you don't want to go. And the prophetic word for Peter is he wasn't an old man. He was still a young guy like me. <laughs> don't laugh too hard. You'll have your day too. It goes by quick. So the prophetic word from Jesus for Peter is when you're an old man, somebody's going to lead you by the hand. And he wasn't an old man. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm trusting you. And I'm going to go to sleep. He was in a deep sleep. The angel had to wake him up. And the 16 guards that were surrounding uh, Peter, Herod himself went down to interrogate him. And, and the way it's phrased is... Uh, there was no small disturbance. He was disturbed that his prized possession was released because the church was praying for him at the time. And, and uh, they were shocked when he showed up at the door and, and uh, Rhoda heard his voice and got so excited she left him standing out in the cold and went and told everybody, Peter's here. Well, he can't be here. We're praying for him to get out of jail. So, so Herod executed all 16 of those guards because they had no answer because the angel blinded their eyes as he put on his sandals, he put on his belt, and they walked out, and the gate opened by itself, and then he went to the house where they were praying. And so it could have ended badly for the, for the warden, but because Paul and Silas showed mercy and, and, and vengeance is mine, God says, I will repay. Do not let yourself be overcome by evil, but overcome master evil with good. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we're going to follow Colossians 1. We are going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing you in all, all respects. We're going to bear fruit in every good work, and we're going to increase in the knowledge of God. We're going to be strengthened with all power through your glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. So we love you. We follow you. We thank you that you've given us a primary gift, one of the seven. Uh, and we thank you that you've given us 13 practical steps in Romans 12 that we can follow to please you and walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen.